My name is Angela Holden. I'm the project manager at the National Conference on Citizenship. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. My name is John McLean. I'm the administrative manager here at the National Conference on Citizenship. Uh, I will be hosting today along with Angela, and I'm zooming in from my desk in Washington, DC. Uh, looking forward to hanging out with you all. Please take a moment uh, to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, please share your name, organization, and where you are zooming in from. I'll go ahead and type my introduction into the chat box as well. And I will also include my pronouns. You are uh, welcome to do so if you are so inclined. We've got Benjamin Nixon from Campus Vote Project zooming in from Philly. Great to have you here, Benjamin. Uh, it's great to see uh, familiar names all, uh, all the time. We love the work that Campus Vote Project is doing. Vanessa Rouse, the Village Square in Tallahassee, Florida. We've got Eliza Carney, who runs the Civic Circle, which uses music and the arts to empower young students to understand and participate in democracy. Courtney Breeze with the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, joining from Los Angeles. De uh, Devin Kane with Community Schools slash Columbia College in Chicago, Illinois. Great to have you here. Kate Dalton from Muck Tracker, addressing media literacy and digital citizenship in Brooklyn, New York. That sounds really cool. Uh, Rich Robertson Robinson with the Fair Election Center in Washington, DC. Thank you so much again, everyone for joining us today. We're excited to have this chat uh, and learn a little bit about podcasting. Uh, Mark Sanders from Charlotte, North Carolina with UNC Charlotte and Faculty Network for Student Voting Rights. Ever important and uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to advance our democracy, especially young uh, amongst students. All right, uh, again, uh, if anyone is just joining us, we're encouraging folks to introduce themselves in the chat with their name, their organization and where they are zooming in from. Evan, Emily Cavanaugh with uh, HS SPED Social Studies in Annapolis, Maryland. Great to have you here, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and it looks like uh, we're slowing down on the introductions in the chat. So I think I'll go ahead and pass it off to my colleague, Angela, to get us started. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, so looks like we'll get started. So like I mentioned earlier, my name is Angela Holden and I'm a project manager here at the National Conference on Citizenship. Uh, our mission at NCOC is to grow the largest network in the country of local leaders committed to full civic and political participation in their communities. Our community is committed to learning from one another, sharing resources and asking for support in order to be successful. And we are so glad to have you all with us. Uh, we've been hosting these learning circles once or twice a month on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Uh, and they provide members of the NCOC community the opportunity to connect around a topic of uh, shared interests to learn from experts and from each other. Um, and it's been a real privilege to learn and grow together over the last year of this program. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any ideas about what kinds of programs and topics would be most helpful. Uh, we're here to make it happen. Um, and then before we begin, uh, we have a quick note about our shared definition of citizenship from NCOC. We view citizens as people who are actively and positively contributing to the civic health and democratic practices of their communities. Uh, the National Conference on Citizenship does not include immigration status as a part of our definition of citizen and citizenship. Uh, our work in Congressional Charter centers us on active citizenship and strengthening civic life in all communities for all people. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, John, who will tell us a bit more about our topic for today. Thank you, Angela. I almost forgot to unmute. Uh, today, we are thrilled to be partnering with the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts united around the goal of helping listeners understand what's broken in our democracy and how people are working together to fix it. The network allows um, individual podcasts to collaborate with one another and provides listeners with a one-stop shop for podcasts about democracy, civic engagement, and civil discourse. The group is funded and organized by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State, which produces the Democracy Works podcast in partnership with WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. 
I'm going to go ahead and read the bios for the fabulous speakers that we're going to be hearing today, and then I will pass it off to them afterwards. First, we will be hearing from Jenna Spinell. Jenna loves a good story and has spent the past 15 years telling them as a writer, podcaster, and marketing professional. She's the communications specialist for the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, where she hosts and produce, produces the Democracy Works podcast in collaboration with WPSU. She's also the founder of the Democracy Group Podcast Network. When she's not, not podcasting, Jenna teaches classes on news writing, independent content creation, and the gig economy for Penn State's Donald P. Belisario College of Communications. Her writing has appeared in outlets inside, uh, including Inside Higher Ed, Current, and Indie Publisher. And after Jenna, we'll be hearing from Brandon Stover, who is the network manager for the Democracy Group. With over five years of design and marketing experience, he is responsible for facilitating collaborations, growing the network's impact, and designing promotional materials. As a podcaster, Brandon hosts and produces the Evolve podcast, where he interviews social entrepreneurs who solve global issues from climate change to evolution, uh, education, excuse me. He also created the Power to Podcast, 90 day, Power to Podcast, 90 day audio course, which teaches podcasting in just 10 minutes a day. Brandon is also in the early stages of building a startup focused on higher education combining students' passions with real-world skills to solve global challenges. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jenna. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John and Angela and the entire NCOC team for having us today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And, and while I do that, just take a minute to say hello to all the familiar uh, faces that are out there, all the, the familiar names I see in the chat. So great to see. Um, some uh, friendly faces here on this call today. Um, so Brandon and I are going to split this presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk first just about the podcasting landscape in general, um, some of the sort of pros and cons of, of why you might want to consider starting a podcast or perhaps not. And then Brandon will come in and talk about um, some of the, the benefits that we've been able to realize through the Democracy Group Podcast Network. And uh, while we're talking, uh, while I'm talking, Brandon will be sharing some links in the chat and I'll be doing the same while he's speaking. So keep an eye on the chat for that. And we are, we are going to try to make this a little bit of a shorter presentation than the, the previous learning circles um, because we know people always have tons of questions about podcasting. So we're happy to spend as much time as, as we have to answer them. So let's dive in without further ado. Um, you know, John and, and Angela already talked a lot about the democracy group then, and Brandon will at the end, just to give you an overview. Um, you can see our shows here. We have 16 podcasts um, from a variety of different perspectives. Sort of my, my mission as the organization's founder is that, you know, democracy is not one specific thing. It's not one specific group of people. It's everybody, right? So how can we create a podcast network that encompasses and exemplifies that notion of all the diversity that democracy brings. So we really tried to do that with the, the shows that are part of the network, both in terms of diverse political views, diverse racial and ethnic views, um, just trying to create that full picture of, of what our democracy means. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about our network as we go through here. But to, to zoom out and think about the podcast landscape. Uh, it seems like everybody has a podcast these days or is, is listening to a podcast. And that is in some respects true. Uh, according to Edison Research, which is a, a leading market research firm in podcasting, more than half of the US population has listened to a podcast. And that number is growing every year. Uh, if you think back to sort of the history of, of podcasting, you can see you know, 2016, 2017 is when shows like Serial really started to take off. Uh, and that really, I think, fueled a lot of the, the growth that we've seen. And now, of course, you know, there's all, all types of, of celebrities and, and big name folks in the space. So that has certainly brought in new listeners as well. And then um, going down from that, so if you think of this like a funnel, uh, about 116 million people or 41% of the, the US population listens to at least one podcast per month. So that's still 
a, a fairly sizable number. And this, this group in particular had its largest growth from 2020 to 2021. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that could be perhaps related to the way people's habits changed during the early days of, of the pandemic and things like that. But um, we don't have time to really get into the, the nitty gritty of all that. But just to say that people are by and large listening to podcasts more consistently than they have ever before since the, the medium started back in 2008. And then um, going down, if you think about the really hardcore podcast listeners, so to speak, the, the people that listen to uh, at least one podcast every week, that is 80 million people or 28% uh, of, of the population. So a little more than, than a quarter, but again, still growing and still lots and lots of people, <laughs> if you think about it. So there is a huge landscape, a huge potential for podcasts out there as a way to reach people who are interested, curious, engaged, not just in politics, but in, in any, any topic. Uh, I was just in a, a thread with some folks about climate change podcasts and you know, you, Brandon can certainly speak to the fact that there's tons of entrepreneurship podcasts and, and really podcasts for everything, right? Um, so there's, there's lots of listeners out there to be had, but podcasting is also a crowded, marketplace. There are more than 2 million podcasts out there and counting. There are thousands and thousands more added to the directories of Apple and Spotify and the, the podcast apps every single day. Uh, and so that is more and more shows competing for listeners time and attention. Uh, so that means that, you know, both new shows and existing shows have to work harder to, to find and retain their audiences, just like any type of, of media. Um, so that was uh, a, a, another key driver in why we started the, the democracy group to help leverage cross promotion and, um, you know, build off of each other's audiences, kind of the rising tide lifts all boats model. Um, making a podcast is also a lot of work. Uh, you know, even if you just do a bare bones interview show or even a solo show where it's just you talking, you still have to think about what you want to say and find someone to talk to. and do all the recording and write the show notes and upload it to the apps and promote it. And there's a lot of pieces that go into it. So it's important to think about, you know, how much time you have to devote to creating a podcast, where a podcast fits in terms of your overall communications goals, whether that's for your organization or for yourself as an individual, you know, what do you want to get out of it and, and what is realistic to get out of it? Um, frankly, many of us on this call um, work in a very niche area, right? The sort of civic engagement democracy space um, doesn't reach everyone as much as all of us would probably probably like it to. I know we're all working very hard trying to bring more and more and more people into the fold, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it is in the grand scheme of things, unlikely but not impossible that our podcasts are ever going to be at the top of the Apple charts or the Spotify charts. And that's okay. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if you think about the, the type of attention that a podcast listener is, is giving you, and I'll talk more about that here in a minute. Um, one more bit of, of perspective, and this is always surprising. Um, so whenever I ask people, you know, I have people come, um, approach me fairly often saying they want to start podcasts. And if I ask them, you know, what they think is a, a, a good estimate of the average number of, of downloads that, that a podcast gets, um, they usually say somewhere around 10,000 um, or at least 5,000. Um, but the, the real numbers are closer to 140. Uh, so according to Libsyn, which is a, a podcast hosting service, um, the median number of downloads across all of the, the podcasts out there, all 2 million, is 140 downloads per episode after 45 days. So they always say on that show, if you have more than the median number, you're better than half the shows out there. And to get to that 5,000, 10,000 number, um, you're really up into like the top 5% of all podcasts. And you know, the ones that we think about, the ones that are on the tops of all the podcast charts, those are the top 1%, the top 0.01%, right? So there's, um, you know, that's often humbling for people or sort of refreshing to see like what the numbers really are. 
but I think for many of us, if we had an in-person event where we had 140 people or even two or 300 people show up or even, even a virtual event, you know, we would consider that to be a resounding success. At least I would, and we do at the, the McCourtney Institute. So, you know, if you think about the fact that, you know, that number of people are giving you their attention week after week or biweekly or however often your podcast comes out, that's nothing to sneeze at either. I mean, that is a huge amount of, of attention and, and investment, especially when there are so many things competing for our attention today, not just podcasts, but all the other media that we consume, all the other demands on our time, uh, those, those sorts of things. And one, one point to add to that, if you think about those 140 people, if they were the most important people that you're trying to reach, for instance, say it's the president and a bunch of Congress people and policymakers that you're reaching, those 140 people, they make a lot of big decisions. So the 140 people are not always uh, created equal in the quality of person that you're reaching. So if you're putting out a good show, reaching up higher quality people, um, you can still make a big impact with a small audience. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Brandon, reaching those, those influencers, those, those, help, those high level people can really help uh, both, both expand your reach and, and make sure your message gets in front of the people it's intended for. But you know, it's not all about the downloads and it's easy to lose sight of that uh, in the, the, that big picture, in that grind I talked about of finding the guests, doing the recording, writing the, the show notes, all of that. Um, it is, there are lots of, of benefits to podcasting beyond just the sheer number of people who, who listen to your show. You know, I think of it, and I think for us in the McCourtney Institute, it's, it's been like a calling card of sorts, right? It gives us a, a, a reason and excuse to reach out to people that we would not have any business contacting otherwise, but it's a great introduction to say, hey, do you want to come on my podcast? We're fans of your work. We want to talk further about this thing you're doing or you're working on. And everybody loves to talk about themselves, right? So it's usually a pretty easy ask to make. Um, and so it's, it's just a great way to, to reach out and, and learn about new things happening in the space and, and meet people doing interesting work. It can also be a funnel for other activities uh, like, like presentations, or um, I know people are, are starting to use podcasts more and more in curriculum and, and those types of things. Um, so there, there's potential there too, to really have that, to hone in on that educational side of things. Um, and it really just lets you punch above your weight class. Um, that is probably the only sports metaphor you'll ever hear me use, but um, I, think it's, I think it's a good one here. You know, um, even if your podcast is small and has, has a niche audience, that's still more people than somebody who doesn't have any of those things. So it's going to be a net benefit for them to come on your show or collaborate with you in some way. But I don't want you to just take my word for it here. We reached out to some of the shows in our network to ask how podcasting has benefited them and their organizations. And Brandon will be sharing the links to these shows in the chat as I run through these here. Um, so one of our partner shows is Democracy Matters from the Center for Civic Engagement at James Madison University. Uh, and their show is really focused on serving the student community at JMU and beyond. So those of you who work in the, the campus vote space, I would recommend checking out Democracy Matters and perhaps connecting with Kara Ong Whaley and Abe Goldberg, the hosts, uh, particularly on student voting, civic engagement types of things. Um, so they've been able to really expand their connections in that realm. Future Hindsight is an independently produced show in our network. Um, Mila Atmos, the host, was so passionate about civic engagement that she decided to start a show completely on her own. She went out and, and assembled a team and has produced some really, really amazing episodes. Um, and she's all about facilitating change. Uh, and that takes, takes a variety of forms, but um, she's used her show to build a community of change makers and people looking for that inspiration. As, as many of you know, it's a slog to work on you know, to, to be involved in organizing and activism, these types of things. So Mila's show, I think, is really a, an uplifter for folks who are doing that work. Um, another show in our network is Another Way by Lawrence Lessig. I'm sure many of you know Larry from, from his work with Equal Citizens. 
Um, and so he's just a, a really great conversationalist. He has some amazing co-hosts as well, uh, Adam Eichen and others. Um, and so they're all about democracy reform, both in, in Congress and other parts of, of government, other institutions. And so they both seek to explain how those institutions and processes work and how we can reform them. So they are really using their show to advance democracy reform goals and, and building, uh, again, just like Future Hindsight, building um, communities of people who are interested in those same types of reforms like HR1, um, reforming the electoral college, those those types of things um, are, are what they focus a lot on on the um, Another Way podcast. A couple more to go through here. Um, one of the newer shows in our network is Democracy Paradox, which is, which is another independently produced show, probably one of the more intellectual shows uh, in our network. Um, Justin Kemp is extremely well read. Um, he's not uh, an academic um, by training anyway, but um, he has the sort of reading background of someone who's done a PhD in, in political science or something like that, but super smart. Um, he's learned a lot from his show and is able to use that to create really intellectually compelling content. Um, so if you are a fan of big ideas, deep dives, that kind of thing, definitely check out Democracy Paradox. And then finally, um, we have Let's Find Common Ground from the Common Ground Committee. And, you know, podcasts are unique in that um, it is a very in-depth medium. You can really have extended, nuanced conversations. It's not a fight on Twitter or a, a three-minute bite on the local news or on the radio or something like that. You can really dive deep on issues and have those nuanced conversations, which is what they do on Let's Find Common Ground. So podcasting, again, is that is the perfect medium for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. Thanks, Jenna. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do as a network, bringing all of these podcasts together. Um, as Jenna mentioned, you know, bringing these people together really helps to lift all uh, boats, as they say, and push this mission forward. Um, and we're not the first people that do this in the space. Uh, the Bridge Alliance, you know, has over 200 members that they're bringing together everybody for the same common goal. And the NCOC, which you guys are um, a part of right now, is doing the same thing, trying to bring these people together that are uh, doing the work in order to, you know, lift everybody's mission forward. So the question is, why should we collaborate with others other than, you know, it's a good thing to do? Um, as I mentioned before, we're all working towards the same goal. So it makes sense to use the leverage and the power of everybody else's organization to help move that goal forward. Um, you also get to leverage their brands. You know, as Jenna mentioned, sometimes when we are interviewing people on our podcast, we get to start punching above our weight class. We get to start using their um, social power and their brands to better instill a brand recognition in our brands as well. Uh, it gives us more distribution uh, channels for our messages um, and gives more awareness for, to each one of our organizations. So when we are collaborating with an organization, they may have their own uh, media channels, whether that be podcasts, newsletters, social media, um, YouTube channels, all these are places that you can put your message out in front of their audience. Um, people also trust who they know. So when you're collaborating with another uh, organization, when you're speaking with them into their audience and get a recommendation from that organization's leaders, uh, they're more likely to trust you. And then it's really important if we are coming to these people saying, hey, we should collaborate to try and move these missions forward, that we demonstrate it ourselves as leaders um, so that everybody can see what that actually looks like. So a little bit of marketing education uh, for you. This is an image from uh, a marketer, uh, Russell Brunson. And what he talks about is gathering your dream 100 of people that you would like to work with and then uh, collaborating with them in a way that you either earn your way in or you buy your way in. So earning your way in would be doing some sort of collaborative project with that other organization. 
buying your way in. Some organizations may have a way for you to advertise to their audience, uh, specifically like here at the Democracy Group. We sometimes read ads in our podcasts or in our newsletters with organizations that we really align with and we think our audience would align with as well. So a little bit of the nitty gritty of how we do it uh, at the Democracy Group. Um, this is a program called Airtable, and it's basically a really fancy Excel sheet. Um, but what we went ahead and did is looked at all the organizations that are within our space in the democracy and civic engagement space, and looked at the ones who do we want to work with the most. And we start getting their contact information and running uh, basically outreach campaigns. Um, we have a wonderful uh, intern with us, Claire Dentner um, from PSU, that she has been reaching out to these organizations, making introductions, and then afterwards, I'll schedule calls and get to know the organization really, really well and find out what ways we can work together, which is one of the ways that we actually uh, got part of this presentation um, with the NCOC. Once you have your list of 100 people, then you need to think about, okay, what are the key activities that we do as an organization that we can collaborate with another organization with? So here at the Democracy Group, we're all about audio, we're all about podcasts. Um, so we do three things. We do podcast cross promotion. If the other organization also has a podcast, really great way to grow a podcast is by having your ad in another podcast. Uh, we also do newsletter cross promotions. We have a newsletter at the Democracy Group. And we try and get that in front of other audiences um, with these other organizations. And then we've also been ramping up our virtual events and webinar series, um, starting those up. But we like to bring our podcast hosts on as panel uh, speakers and then bring in um, experts or hosts from other shows or the other organizations. And finally, once you are working with these uh, other collaborators, your goal is really to bring them to your assets. So at the Democracy Group, we have our main uh, podcast that gives a sampling of all the different uh, podcasts from our network, drops it in episodes, so you can get a sample of that. And then we also have our newsletter. And both of these assets are ways that we can talk to those audiences uh, directly. So what's the results of doing this sort of work? It's a lot of work to set up these collaborations, but it gets us uh, quite a bit of reach for our organization. So network wide, uh, that's all the podcasts in our network. We're at over 200,000 monthly downloads. We have 387 newsletter subscribers currently. And right now on our dream 100 list, uh, we're actually over that number. We have 200 potential partnerships. That's where we're starting to get into works. We've executed on 12 and we have 17 planned uh, currently coming up. And so again, this is ways that we get our brand out further. Uh, we get our message out there more. Uh, also, we have some opportunities for early and potential revenue streams. We're looking at, you know, how can we package our podcast as curriculum, uh, showing that with the other higher education institutions. Like I said, we run advertisements sometimes on our podcast. So it gives us a little bit of leverage there of all. But most of all, um, the biggest thing that it is doing for us is helping us to fulfill our mission. As we said before, the democracy group's goal is helping our listeners to understand what's broken in our democracy and how people are working together to fix it. And here's a, a few of the testimonials that we get from our listeners. We actually did interviews with some of our listeners to find out you know, ways we can serve them better. Um, and they are very appreciative of the work that we're doing, helping to uh, get this mission out there um, to make more educated voters uh, and more enabled citizens. So if you guys uh, would like to collaborate with us, we are always open to any creative projects, um, collaborating with cross promotion, any sorts of way that way. Um, you can reach out to me. I'm the network manager at the Democracy Group. My email is brandon at democracygroup.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, let's give a huge round of applause to our fabulous speakers or emoji response. Um, that was an amazing conversation um, about podcasting. 
so with that, we're going to transition to a quick uh, question and answer session. So um, we pulled some questions from the chat, but we have some pre-submitted questions that um, I can just start us off with and then feel free um, if anyone has questions that they wanna drop in and we can grab them and um, share those out. Uh, so the first one was submitted by Christian Perez and they asked, how much time should you plan to launch a podcast effectively? Yeah, um, do you wanna take a stab at that one first, Brandon? Sure. Um it really depends. You have to start thinking about as an organization, you know, as Jenna mentioned, what are your goals with the podcast and what kind of show do you want to start doing? Um, if you are doing one where you're just solo speaking, uh, it may be a little easier to launch. You're still going to need to plan out, um, you know, the things that you're going to speak to. Uh, if you're doing an interview podcast, it's going to take a little longer because you got to schedule out those guests and, um, you know, most people launch with three to five episodes um, within the first couple of weeks. And so if you're doing an interview podcast, that's three to five people that you need to go interview, edit the podcast, uh, all of that. Um, if you're doing an educational one where you're teaching people, um, a good example of this is the Andrew Huberman uh, pod podcast out of Stanford. Um, does really in-depth uh, education uh, about health and neuroscience and those sorts of things. Um, but he has to put together those, uh, all of that education to basically teach people. Um, so that takes some time as well. Um, so I would say that if you are going to do it well and uh, have a successful launch, um, that you're going to need two to three months uh, of good preparation um, to launch your show. Yeah, and I would just say to to keep thinking about, you know, so you have that that um, initial launch, that first group of three to five episodes, but, you know, what comes after that, right? So what's your, are you going to be a weekly show, a bi-weekly show, a monthly show? You know, you need to, in order to really establish uh, a listener base, you need to have content out consistently. You need to just like a, a TV show or anything else in your life that you subscribe to, you need to know when you can expect the episodes so people can start to make you part of their routine. So, you know, Democracy Works, for example, comes out on Monday mornings. And I know that our listeners tell me that they listen while they walk their dogs first thing in the morning or while they're, they were commuting more in the, the pre-COVID times than now. But, you know, we're, we are part of, of people's Monday morning routines. And so that's, that's important to make sure that, you know, whenever your content is, is coming out to make sure it's consistent. Awesome. And then I have some related questions. Um, thanks, Eliza, for um, dropping those in the chat. So um, Eliza asked, how often is it recommended that you run a podcast to realistically build audience? Um, so I, I think that the shows in, in our network, um, the, the sort of the least frequent that they come out is, is biweekly. Uh, I know that there are some podcasts that, that are monthly, um, and that, that may work again, depending on your, your staff resources and things like that. But I think my recommendation would be either weekly or biweekly, depending on, on your resources. If you have a, a team or can you know, enlist the help of a, of a production partner, maybe, you know, uh, public media like we do with, with WPSU, or there, if there's, if you are, if you can collaborate with a, a production organization in some way, if you have that budget, those resources, maybe you can think about a weekly show. Um, but if you're doing it more on your own or your team is doing it completely in-house, and I think bi-weekly is probably more realistic, and I think too, the other thing that I'm starting to hear more about sort of in the industry, I just got back from a, a podcasting conference um, called Podcast Movement. Um, and you know, one of the things that they talk a lot about is like shorter episodes, just as people have more and more and more shows that they're subscribing to, like don't be too precious about your episode content, right? Don't be afraid to make it short and just give people like get right to the heart of it. Um, you know, very few people want to hear like, what you did over the weekend, unless it's like people you already know, or you're a celebrity or, you know, something like that. Um, so, you know, it's shorter episodes uh, can be an asset and they may require less production time 
than something that's an hour long or you know something like that. Um, how short? Um, yeah, I think half an hour uh, or even even like 15 or 20 minutes. I mean, if you can really have a, a tight, you know, this is what you need to know. This is like, you know, I, one of my uh, podcasts I listen to uh, regularly is Today Explained from Vox. And those are usually 20 or 25 minutes. Now it's a very well produced 20 or 25 minutes, but they sort of get right to the heart of whatever it is they're talking about. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's all types of, of, you know, shorter form podcasts. I know Civics 101, which is a show some of you might um, be familiar with as well. They're focused more on the, the K-12 space, but they do some really great short, even like 10 minute episodes. Like this is what you need to know about, um, I don't know, the filibuster or, you know, some other topic that's going on in, in politics. They'll just have maybe one expert that just explains it cuts the chase and that's it. I think a really good way to look at this is a look at how much uh, resources you have, as Janet was mentioning, how big is your team? Um, if you don't have much resources, you don't have much time to put towards this, um, then maybe doing biweekly or one a month is uh, recommended. But if you have the time and resources to put towards it, I would lean more towards weekly. Um, and if even better if you can do, you know, a couple a week or three times a week. Um, but that's very, uh, that's hard to do and to be consistent with. Um, the other thing is looking at it with how uh, long the podcast should be versus how frequent you come out. So if you're going to do, you know, a two hour long podcast, that's probably going to take a lot of material to produce that podcast. And maybe you only do that once a month. Um, if you have our you know, doing current events and um, are doing short 10, 15 minute podcasts, you may be able to do two or three of those a week um, because they're shorter. So that's leveraging uh, frequency against how long the podcast should be um, gives you a nice balance. Great, that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, so we will move to the next question. So Elaine Grant, we submitted this. Uh, what are some new strategies that organizations can use to collaborate with others through podcasting, including learning from failures? Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I think that like what Brandon touched on, you know, the, the sort of the standard in podcasting for a long time has been, you have to have a podcast in order to collaborate with a podcast. But I think that that's changing. Uh, you know, we've had, as Brenda mentioned, partners that have other services they're trying to promote. For example, the, the do audio ads across our shows. Um, so for example, if your organization has a virtual event that's coming up and you think that the podcast listening audience would be interested, you could, you know, work with podcasts to put an ad for that episode on, on the feeds of, of the shows that you're interested in. And a lot of the, the technology has improved such that you can have ads that are what are called dynamically inserted, which means that you can set it up on the, on the, your hosting platform that it automatically will drop the ad into the episode in a predefined date range. Um, so if you're, you know, your event is on September 30th, and you want to run the ad from September 20th to 29th, we can set all of that up to do. Um, the same thing, you know, I have this vision, and, and Brandon has heard this multiple times by now, but of, you know, authors using podcast advertising as a way to promote their books. I know people like to be guests on podcasts when they have books coming out, but there's not enough time. Uh, and there's, you know, the podcast to book ratio doesn't quite line up so that every author can be interviewed on every show that they want to go on. But uh, you know you can have a, a 60 second ad where you give your main plug for your book and where people can buy it and all of that. And it still gets that message in front of people who, if you know that a certain podcast interviews other authors in your genre, then that, that list, that audience is probably going to be interested in, in what you're doing as well. So, and that can also be a great first step to um, get your foot in the door with, with with a podcast and maybe be on as a guest one day um, just to sort of start making those introductions. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that we've been thinking about. And then 
think about um, some of the content and media that you're already creating as an organization. If you were doing video or, you know, virtual events like um, we're doing now, uh, you can repurpose the audio for that and put it into podcasts. Um, it's something that we do as an organization, uh, as well as if you are writing, you know, really well written articles or uh, books. I've heard many podcasters, um, you know, either read chapters of their book out on the podcast, uh, or, you know, have an article that they're frequently uh, talking about within the podcast. Um, so you can start to send those types of mediums, um, say articles or videos to podcasters and, you know, ask if they could feature that on their podcast. Great. Um, the next question is from Alzada Wilson. Uh, shout out to her from Junior State of America. That's our next uh, learning circle <laughs> happening October 6th. So I'll put that plug in there. Uh, she asked how to make a podcast stand out in an oversaturated market. Yeah, that is the question that every podcaster has. Uh, and I mean, I think at a, at a basic level and this I don't mean this to sound like trite or anything but make a show that people want to listen to you know really put the listener first I think especially as organizations we're very internally focused and we can lose sight of that I know I'm certainly guilty of that you know what what is you certainly we've, we've talked about in this presentation like you, you a podcast should absolutely achieve your organization's goals but that should not come at the expense of the informational or educational value that you're delivering to listeners. Um, so just think about that, um, you know, as you are, take any opportunity that you can to ask for feedback, whether that's if you are just starting out, you know, make a pilot episode, one to see if it's something you enjoy doing and you wanna keep doing, you have the bandwidth to do and send that around, send it to your friends, your colleagues, just people get some feedback on how you can make it better um, and, you know, really, really go to market, so to speak, with a really well honed show. I think that's another change in the industry as, you know, more money and more big name players come into it. The days of like figuring it out as you go in your first couple of months are sort of going by the wayside. Now everybody has bigger launches and they sort of have these campaigns around launching a show to try to build that that buzz um, at the at the get go. So if you don't have like a product that's ready for prime time right away, it's going to be hard to build that that critical mass right out of the gate. Yeah, I don't have anything more to add to that. Uh, that was perfect. I mean, the, the big takeaway is, you know, put out a show that people actually want to listen to. And it sounds yeah. trite, but it's it's very true. Yeah, and there are um, other ways that if you have if you have a budget, you could do some paid advertising on the different podcast platforms. They have different promotional uh, options for as little as a couple hundred dollars. Um, if you have say two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars, you can do a pretty robust ad campaign. I don't know that we have time to get into all the details of that, but definitely um, reach out to us if you want to learn more about the the nuts and bolts of that kind of stuff. Awesome. So we have one more pre-submitted question. Um, if anyone else wants to add anything in the chat, uh, I'll just read this one out from Stephen Buckley uh, asking, what are the best platforms for democracy advocates? Hmm. So I think if I can couple that with the question Stephen just posted in the chat, um, one of the things that, that Brandon uh, has been doing for us is making on our, our website topic guides. Um, and we've done some collaborations. I know we did one, for example, with, with Muck Tracker, uh, Kate and uh, her team there to, uh, on misinformation, for example. And we have both um, you know, lists of episodes and um, written content on particular topics. Um, so Steve, I don't know that we've done anything specifically on measurements. Um, but if you want to reach out to, to Brandon with some more information about what what you're looking for, um, he and I and, and our intern Claire can work together on putting something 
together that might help meet that need for you or help sort of call through all of the content we have across our shows. And that goes for anyone else on this call too. If you have ideas or, you know, there, I really am looking for podcasts about this specific topic, but I don't know where to start um, or you want something to use in, in teaching or other programming that you're doing, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. We're happy to work with you on those types of requests. Um, and I did want to mention to uh, to that point that uh, you just made, Jenna, we are going to send out an email with the recording for today's session, and then we'll include all the links shared today um, and then contact information, too. So if anyone wants to reach out, has any questions or um, feedback ideas, uh, happy to, you know, speak with you about that. Uh, we do have about 13 more minutes. I don't know. And Jenna, if you wanted to expand on anything else, if there are any other questions, um, I know there's some topics that you all said um, could go into more detail, but <laughs> we also don't have to, um, but just wanted to open that up. Yeah, sure. So I'm happy to, to continue taking questions if anyone else has them, but I know one thing, usually the, the first thing that people ask me about when they say they want to start a podcast is like, what kind of microphone do I need and how do I actually record? And um, you know, there are uh, lots of, of options out there for all of those things. And the, the pandemic has made some of that much easier. Um, there are uh, recording services like Squadcast and Zencaster um, are, are two that I know are, are specifically set up for podcasts where it works much like a Zoom call that we're all on right now, except it puts everyone on their own separate audio track, which gives you more control when you're editing later on. Um, there are lots of people that record podcasts on Zoom too, um, depending on how you have your Zoom set up, you can mimic some of those same features. Um, you know, I know uh, Brandon has a very nice microphone there. Maybe you could tell us a little bit, Brandon, about gear and, uh, you know, how you make it work as, a, as, as somebody running your own show. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a, a one man team. Um, so I do all the uh all the research, the interviewing, the production, all of it myself. Um, so a little bit about uh, the gear here. I'm specifically speaking with a pod mic, a Rode pod mic. Uh, they're just at $100, so it's um, very affordable. Uh, I have a couple other pieces of equipment that make it sound deeper and better um, that aren't necessary when you're first starting out. And actually, uh, one of the mics that I suggest when you're first starting out is the AT2100, or I think they just updated to the AT2200. Um, very affordable. I think it's just under $100 or at $100 and a great quality sounding mic. And it plugs right into your computer, mm -hmm. right into your USB, um, which there's a lot of mics you have to look at. Um, as you can see, there's this big wire coming out of mine, um, and that's an XLR cable. And you need a special uh, board to run that um, with your computer. Um, so that's a little bit about equipment on my computer to do the editing. Um, one a, a really great program that just came out um, within the last year, last couple of years, is called Descript. And instead of having to edit on your computer with the audio waveforms, um, you can edit with text, just like you're editing a blog or something. Uh, so it makes it editing go a lot faster, a lot easier for those that have never edited audio before. Um, and then uh, once you have it edited, um, you're going to have to distribute it uh, on the internet and to all the podcast apps. And there's plenty of podcast hosts. I would just Google uh, podcast hosts and you'll find them. Um, I happen to use Simplecast. It's a really great one. As Jenna mentioned, it allows you to drop dynamic ads in, has lots of great stats uh, that you can follow with your podcast. Um, but there's also free uh, podcast um, hosts like Anchor, which allows it to get up and running very, very fast. Um, but again, just Google those, look at the different benefits each one has. Um, and that's kind of the, the quick nuts and bolts. Like if you're just getting started uh, very fast and then you can always, if you really enjoy podcasts, you can start upgrading and getting a little more into it as you can see I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will just co-sign that AT2100 microphone. That is my go-to uh, for, for Democracy Works. My co-hosts all have them. They're, they're very easy to use, really no technical knowledge required. Um, and I, I feel like, um, let's see, um, Eliza and Benjamin in the chat, you guys should like 
connect because Eliza is saying you have, you know, you're interested in learning more about the, the technical side of it. You have journalism experience and Benjamin saying you have the sound design audio production experience. So there might be like a budding podcast collaboration <laughs> happening uh, right here. Um, but, but hopefully um, Eliza, so that covered some of your, your technical questions. Uh, and it sounds like Benjamin might be a resource there too. Great, and then I also wanted to highlight Mark Sanders' question in the chat. Um, so can you say more about the outreach campaign that you have? Can organizations reach out to you? And if so, who exactly for folks to be on one of the Democracy Group podcasts? Um, there's another couple more questions in there. Does it have to be for a specific event, promotion, or can it be that, uh, or can it just be that you can contact the organization if you think they'd be valuable to have on one of your podcasts? Okay, I'm going to take a moment to take all that in. <laughs> so I, I, I'll just work my way down uh, these questions. Um, so with the outreach campaign, people can absolutely reach out to us. In fact, um, I'll drop it here in the chat. We have a partnerships page that talks about uh, our organization and um, how we run collaborations and some of our numbers for the network. Uh, it's a really great overview. And then on there, if you're interested in working with us, we have um, a short application to just find out, you know, what are your goals with the collaboration on your guys' end? Um, it does not have to be specific for an event or a promotion. We are very much open to uh, creative collaborations, um, ones that are unique to your organization. Um, we have uh, a few that might be coming up in the works um, where we're placing like our podcast with on the, uh, their website and helping to call topics uh, around the things that they're writing about in their blog. So pairing, you know, written uh, text with audio. Um, so that's something unique that we don't do with a whole lot of other organizations. Um, if you're looking to collaborate with us, again, you can contact me at brandon at democracygroup.org um, or fill out the form. And then, yeah, if you guys have uh, people that you would like to have interviewed on our podcast, definitely um, reach out to me. Uh, give me a little bit of information about that person, bio, um, you know, other interviews that they've been on. And I can absolutely put a call out to our hosts. Many of them are looking uh, for guests and pass those along. And then the ones that are excited to do that, I can connect you with them. Yes, podcasts are beasts that need to be fed. So we are uh, always looking for guests and the shows on our network have different frequencies, different publishing schedules. So um, yes, yeah, so don't hesitate to, to reach out if you have a guest suggestion. Awesome, sounds good. So I think I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so I think we can maybe give six more minutes back. Um, so just wanted to thank our amazing speakers, Brandon and Jenna for joining us um, and for all of you for being here. Uh, and like I said previously, we're gonna share out um, the links that were in the chat uh, in the email and then also the recording of this session. And then feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any thoughts or feedback about um, NCOC program. Uh, and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, guys.